All right, human beings. Hey, Bill. We got a lot to cover today, so we're going to do some stuff quick, but we got to review. One of the things that we talked about is that our mind changes our heart, which changes our... How fast do you think we can get up to? So let's, let's just see if we can slowly turn up. So can you guys keep up with me, you think? All right, so our minds change our hearts, change our will, our minds. Oof, man. Yeah, our minds, what the truth that we know and understand, what we believe, changes what we love, and what we love changes what we do. And that's what we've been talking about the last couple of days, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more today. Now, I'm going to... We, have a, we do have a lot to cover today, and I'm really excited. But while I tell this interesting, fascinating story, if you want to open up your Bibles to Isaiah 66, you are welcome to do that. But I want to tell you the story. A couple years ago, uh, maybe less than that, between one and two years ago, I was cooking dinner. And uh, I get off work a little earlier than my wife, so a lot of times I'll be making dinner. And... I was in the kitchen and I cut my hand. And uh, right, right on this finger. And um, it was pretty bad. It really wasn't a cut as much as a stab. And there was a knife and it was in my finger and it was gross and scary. And so I used my other hand and dialed my phone and called my wife and said, hey, I love you. You might be married to someone with nine fingers. No, I didn't say that. But I said, can you, can you take me to the emergency room? And she was like, okay, I'm already on my way home, so no problem. I probably made it sound worse than it was because, you know, drama. And so I, I said, there's this big problem. And I was kind of scared because um, not as much as many of you, but I do play some music from time to time. And I thought, man, if I can't use my finger, if I did something bad, that could be scary. So I was a little concerned. And so my wife drove me to the hospital and we filled out some paperwork and we waited and then we filled out some paperwork and we waited and then we waited and we filled out some paperwork and we waited and we got moved into a different room and we finally saw someone who gave me some paperwork and we waited and um, all this time passed and eventually they're like uh, let's put a little glue on there and they sent me home but while I was there the one thing the doctor did tell me was that this particular injury is one that's becoming more and more common in fact they said over the past few years there have been more people coming into hospital emergency rooms saying that they had stabbed their hand than ever before in fact it kept going up and up and up and up and I thought man what could it be what's the reason for this are we using knives differently or are we distracted by our smartphones what's going on you know what he said avocados <laughs> I was cutting an avocado and I was trying to poke the pit of it and I did but I also poked something else and he said that was happening all the time and I went he said go home and look it up so I went home and I looked it up listen to some of these headlines these are headlines from newspapers real headlines Bruncher's beware, avocado hand injuries on the rise. You know it's serious business when they actually name an injury. It's not just a cut on the hand, it's avocado hand. Um, <laughs> avocado hand is sending people to the ER because people don't know how to cut their fruit. That's a headline. Can you imagine opening up a newspaper or scrolling on your phone, uh, if you remember when you used to maybe have those before you came here, and that's the headline that you read. Or avocado hand why fruit has become a health hazard or avocado hand is something super scary that you should know about or avocado hand is real and can turn your dream brunch into an ER nightmare uh, and those those are seemingly crazy but all the articles said pretty much the same thing you know what they said avocados are not dangerous but knives are and you might find yourself thinking that the most important thing you're working with is this green fruit. But actually, the most important thing that you're working with is this pointy knife. And knives are sharp. And sharp things, like knives, are made to cut things. And your hand is a thing. <laughs> That's pretty much what all the articles said. And they were saying, don't 
Don't be so obsessed with trying to get this avocado right that you forget that a knife is sharp. And just because you're familiar with a knife and your kitchen might have lots of knives, doesn't mean knives can't cut you. And it seems silly, but this is something that happens to us all the time in our faith, where things that we see around us a lot seem like they, they're very normal and safe. We think that just because we interact with God, that, uh, you know, he is really safe and we don't have to worry about cutting ourselves. Or just because we open up the Bible and we're so used to it that all of a sudden it seems dull to us. But if it seems dull to you and it's not dull, you might end up cutting yourself. Does that make sense? And so today we're going to talk quite a bit about how God actually changes our minds and then goes about changing our hearts, and that affects our will and our actions. And the way He changes our minds is through His Word. And just like I forgot and many other people forget that knives are sharp, a lot of us can easily forget that the Word of God, the Bible, is sharp. Um, Hebrews 4.12, very famous verse, says, the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, sharper than any avocado-cutting knife. <laughs> and it penetrates, not just the finger, but it penetrates, even dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. That's a, that's a sharp knife, right? Uh, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So my kitchen knife is sharp, and I should treat it in a way that, I, that shows that I recognize that it's sharp, so that I, I respect it and handle it and use it in the right ways. And in the same way, the Bible is a sharp tool, and it's not a tool in my hand. It's a tool in God's hand that He gives to us, and we need to treat it for what it is, a sharp sword. Does that make sense? Because when you use a sharp thing, thankfully when I cut myself, I cut myself. It's bad when you harm yourself. It's worse when you harm someone else. Uh, and it's worse when our neglect or um, just lack of care causes injury to ourselves or to others. So we want to treat the Bible and approach the Bible as something that's sharp. Something that can actually change us. So, just really basically, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but God's Word is something very specific. When we open up the Bible, we need to recognize that God has written a book. Okay? Some of your teachers and the faculty members here are super smart, and they've written books. Um, some of you are super smart, and you've read books. Maybe you've even written some really cool fan fiction about, you know, how Violin Girl defeats the evil enemy of out of tunity or whatever <laughs> and um, maybe that's your your thing but uh, God in his perfection has written a book and if God is perfect what do you think his book is like perfect, perfect. and so he, it's perfectly inspired he has given the, the human beings who wrote it everything that they needed, directed them, carried them along to put this material together, and it's perfectly compiled. He, he put it together the way that he wanted it, and he wanted it to be in a way that we could use it and understand it. And I also want to ask this question, just for you to think about, but if God wrote a book, and his book says that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, what makes it so sharp? And what do I need to know about this book in order to approach it in the right way? Because a sharp tool is really great. You can use a sharp tool to cut an avocado, or you can use a sharp tool to cut your finger. One is good, and one is bad. Unless you're cutting someone else's finger and you try to. That's also probably bad. But I hear what you're saying. Um, so let's start out by looking at what the Bible has to say about itself. Um, would anyone, let's see, would any girl in a loud and robust voice be willing to read Isaiah 66, 1 through 2? Yes, let's do it. That's cool. I will bless those who have humbled and contrite hearts, 
Thanks. Yeah, so I really want to focus on that last part that we almost had to get it to be continued. But at the very end, if you didn't hear that, that God blesses those who are humble and contrite in their heart and who tremble at God's word. Now, maybe you can think in your mind of a time when you experienced something and you, you trembled. And maybe you can't think of it. Um, but right now, where you're sitting, can you try and make yourself tremble? Just go for it. Uh, that looks like some cool dance move. It's looking good. Yeah, you can stop now. It looks weird from up here. But uh, you can't actually make yourself tremble. It's an involuntary response. And uh, there's two key sections here. It's involuntary and it's a, a response. And when you encounter something amazing or scary, your body might tremble in response, but not because you told it to, but because it's natural. And you're used to that. If somebody surprises you and pops out from nowhere and is like, aha, you might be like, ah, and you didn't think it through and say, you know what I'm going to do? When this person pops out, let me draw it up. First, my eyes are going to get wide. And then I'm going to put my hands up. And then I'm going to make a beautiful, I don't know what pitch it was, if some of you can tell me, but I can go, ah! And I'm going to do that on purpose. That doesn't happen. What happens instead is someone scares you and pops out and your ah! just happens. It's an involuntary response. Does that make sense? involuntary response it just happens to you or if someone tells a hilarious joke or someone around you is funny you just get the giggles you don't you don't just you don't have to tell yourself to laugh if you do the person's not actually funny um, I'm not saying you shouldn't make yourself laugh sometimes if it's an important person who like a teacher who determines your grade you should <laughs> Good joke. And, uh, or if it's your parent and you know, you know that laugh at their jokes, they're, they're going to make you do more chores, then you're going to be like, oh, good one, Dad. Um, but uh, see, you're doing it to me right now. Um, so, and all of, that's, all of that is, is fine, but the real laughter is involuntary. And we have a problem here as Christians. A lot of times we tell ourselves, I know God's word and I know that I should tremble at it, so I'm really going to try to. I know I'm supposed to take it seriously and be amazed at it, and so I'm going to try and be amazed. But the fact is, you can't make yourself tremble. You can't make yourself be amazed. Instead, you just have to experience something for what it actually is and let it move you. So, uh, when I was young, younger than many of you, when I, uh, my, my brother and sisters and I would go out into the woods a lot, and we would build these little forts. And there was a particular time where one summer I had gone to a beach pier and I had bought a gun that shoots rubber bands. And so there was a little version of me, and I'd be out in the woods, you know, and it was a cool revolver type one. And I, I would be out there, you know, and I'd be like setting up the scenario. I'd be thinking, you know, maybe it's, you know, I'm a spy out here and I'm doing my, do, 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 you know, because you got to theme music yourself, you know, and depending on if I was sneaking and I'm going around and I'd shoot my rubber bands. But the problem was if I shot all my rubber bands, what, what did I have to do next? Find them all. I had to go pick them all up. So um, I went and picked them up. And one time I picked up this rubber band and I wasn't really paying attention. And as I picked it up, it was just a couple of inches away from this coiled up copperhead snake. And so I reached out and I touched it and I touched the snake. Before I, and then I realized, oh, that's not, that's not just pine needles. There's something else there. Guess what my natural response was? Great one. Yes, you got it. No, I actually, um, I don't really remember. I remember running back to my house um, through the woods as if the snake was like, I'm going to get you because you gave me a back rub. But, but public service announcement, don't just go rubbing snakes. But um, so I, I, just, I freaked out and I was like, oh, my goodness. So I ran back and, uh, you know, had to change my pants and all the regular stuff. And um, so... I, I went back, and that, that was a really regular response. And the reason I did that was because I was in the Cub Scouts, and I knew about snakes. They will chomp you. <laughs> they are venomous, and uh, especially this kind of snake. And it could really hurt me, so I was really afraid of it. Now, my, my wife's 
brother, my brother-in-law, his name is Josh, and he has a dog. He lives in California, and he had to take his dog to get trained so that his dog, when they went hiking and stuff, wouldn't just be like, oh, look at this little snake, I'm going to go lick it. <laughs> because dogs don't know what I know about snakes. Does that make sense? So what had to happen is they had a special class where you would bring your dogs in, and there were certain types of things that they would do to teach the dog not to lick, chomp, sniff, smell, nuzzle up against the snakes. Because, you know, a lot of dogs, you know, they're just trying to have fun out in the woods. They're like, oh, what's this unique smell? But then, they, then a snake bites them on the nose, and you got to carry your dog six miles out and then drive to the dog hospital and then have a dog funeral, and it sounds expensive. And you love your dog. He was your only friend. And so it gets sad. And so they had to teach the dog to respond. And what ultimately they had to do is teach the dog what they were dealing with so that the dog would have an involuntary response of fear when certain things happen. So if there's a rattlesnake out there, they would you know, shake this little rattle and the, the dog would learn. I'm not sure what the methods are to run away whenever they, were, they heard the little rattle because the dog didn't know what I knew. But there needed to be this response because of this understanding that danger was there. The dog had to be taught something that most of us might already know. Don't snuggle with snakes. So, and, and that's, that seems silly, and, I, and I'm talking about it like that, but I want to just make a, a point really quick about what we've been talking about this whole week, how our mind changes our heart, which changes our will. The word that I've sometimes used instead of change is affects. Our mind affects our heart, which affects our will. And the word affect is related to the word affection. What, what is affection? Love. love. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't just say love because then it sounds like you don't have it. So you, you got to be into it. Like, love. you know, right. <laughs> yeah. So when we're talking about a f something that affects something else, it's saying our love changes us. Does that make sense? So if, um, if I know that my wife is great and wonderful and beautiful, that makes me love her, and the fact that I love her affects, my affections change how I treat her. Does that make sense? I know she's wonderful, beautiful, special, then that causes me to love her, and out of my love or my affections, I want to do kind and good things for her. Now, I've just told a bunch of stories. Snakes, dogs and snakes, things that you didn't need to know about me and my wife, um, and uh, a lot of stuff. All of these things come together to make this one point. Now listen to me very clearly. Love changes everything, because you will pursue what you love. The reason that we sin is because we love what sin has to offer us. When, um, when you're... When, when your friend or, well, I'll set up a scenario maybe all of you have experienced. When your mom says, did you clean your room and you didn't, you say, yes. Why do you tell that lie? Because I don't want to clean my room. Okay, because you don't want to clean your room. So you love the idea of doing what you want to do instead of what your mom wants you to do. And so you tell this lie, right? You're pursuing love or you're pursuing what you love. Or you don't you, want to get in trouble. You don't want to get in trouble because you don't like being in trouble. You love not being in trouble. So when you lie, you feel like it's going to save you from being in trouble. Does that make sense? We all pursue what we love. And when what sin does for us is it, it sets things up in our, in our mind that says, this is going to fulfill you. This is going to satisfy you. You're going to love it. It's kind of like a commercial. Now, I know all of you don't watch TV or um, things like that, but if you've ever seen an ad on YouTube or the television, if you're an adult here and still watch one of those, um, ads come on and they'll, they'll have a product like toothpaste. <laughs> and this, it'll show a person, they're all sad, and they're like, if you brush your teeth with 
we're looking for a sponsor here at Chehi, Colgate, Crest, Aqua something, something, something. Um, but if you brush your teeth with this, then everything's going to be better. And all of a sudden, this person's smiling, and everybody's waving, and the person's hair is done, and they're confident in their business meeting, and they're like, ding! Uh, and it's like, your teeth, uh, your teeth changed everything. And what the commercial does is it, I hate to tell you this, it lies to you. It tells you if your teeth are white, you're going to have friends. Is that true? Do you think there's any white-toothed, lonely folks? Yeah, there are. You think there, it says if you have white teeth, you're going to be successful. Like everybody at your workplace is going to look up to you. Do you think there's any like people with white teeth that get fired? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So what the commercial does is it, it actually lies to you. Man, I undid the sponsorship deal. But, uh, but listen, uh, when we think about this, when we think about what sin does in this way, it tells us a lie. It says, you're going to love it, you're going to love it, you're going to love it. But the truth is, it doesn't actually come through. It lies to us. And what God does when he changes us is he makes us so that when we love him, he actually does satisfy us. He actually does come through. He actually does meet our needs. And so when we understand that he is wonderful and he is beautiful and we grasp that in our minds, then we love him. And when we live for him, it satisfies us. What's up? I was going to say something about what you were talking about earlier with the ads. Uh -huh. There's a word for that. And I like applying it to sin, too, called propaganda. Propaganda, yes. Sin is a propagandist. Love that. Um, and that is all true. So, what we need to do is train ourselves to have a natural response to what God says that causes us to tremble and be in awe of Him, to love Him and be amazed by Him so that uh, we want to live for Him instead of just believing what the world has to say. We're kind of like my brother-in-law's dog. we got to get trained a little bit. Now, don't be offended. Dogs are lovely. Um, when I compared us all to dogs, me too, we all need help, and sometimes we like to be rubbed on the belly. And so, this is important for all of us. But I want to talk to you about how God's Word does this, and I am going to fly. If you are a note taker, you can just jot down some of these references, and or ask your counselors about them, or talk to me about them. Ha happy to discuss with you. Um, but I want to tell you the truth about the truth that helps you love what you should love so that you have the will to use your will to love God. Does that make sense? That's a lot of words. Okay, so first of all, when we look at the Bible and when we open it up, we need to understand that God's Word is power. Notice what I'm saying. God's Word is power. It doesn't contain power. God's Word is power. Uh, if you want to look up a verse that goes with this, Genesis 1-3, right at the beginning, you might be familiar with how God says, let there be light. And when God says, let there be light, what happens? Light. Yeah, so here's what, what really went down. There was no light. God said light with his word, and light came true. Light came true. It was dark. God said light. God's word was so powerful that light came true. That is crazy. His word is so awesome, so amazing, and so powerful that it changes the world around it. Everything else conforms to what God says. He never has to conform what he says to anything around him. I love this little quote here. It's from author N.D. Wilson. He says, I look at the stuff of the world and I ask myself, what is it made of? Words. Magic words. Words spoken by the infinite. Words so potent, spoken by the one so potent, that they have weight and mass and flavor. They are real. They have taken on flesh and dwelt among us. They are us. In the Christian story, the material world came into existence at the point of speech. And that speech was from nothing. That when God said, let there be, there was. And his word is so powerful, it shapes reality. Do you know that you exist because you're a spoken person? That everything around you has been created and is sustained by the power of God? And that this world, this, this floor that we're standing on, this, the grass that you see outside, the sun in the sky, that those things exist because God spoke them into existence, that his word is so real, so strong, so right, that everything just gets into place when he says it should be this way. How awesome is that? And so when you open up the Bible and you read what God says, you're reading the words from the same guy who said, let there be light and light came true. So when he says about you, you are my son, who are you? 
You're his son. You are his son. That is the truth. When he says, you're adopted into my family, whose family are you in? His family. What if you don't feel like you're in his family? You're still in his family. Because his word is power. His word is power. And what he says is the case. Next, his word is truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says about the disciples, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Notice again, he does not say God's word contains the truth. What does he say? It is the truth. It doesn't align with the truth. It doesn't, like, sometimes uh, have little truth nuggets in it. It doesn't help people know the truth. It is the truth. And he says that this truth sanctifies us. And sanctify is just a fancy word for makes us look like him. So when you know the truth in your mind, it starts the process of transforming you to look like Jesus. So his word is power, his word is truth, his word is eternal. Check this out, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. So mountains are worn down and beaches erode away and things come and go, but God's word lasts. And it never becomes less important. Um, my brother's really into computers, and he used to read computer books back in, like, 1999. How valuable and useful for your iPhone do you think it is if uh, he reads to you from a computer book from 1999? Not so valuable anymore. The tape with the programming may have changed. It probably did, though. Yeah, so it's, 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 not, it's all out of date. And that was only, like, you know, 20 years ago. In 20 years, this book went from being valuable to being worthless. But when God speaks, His Word is eternal. It doesn't change. It doesn't get out of date. It doesn't, uh, as it gets old, it doesn't become weak. As it, be, as it gets old, it continues to be true. It continues to be power. Never outdated, never counteracted, and it can never be improved. Because God does everything perfectly, and can a perfect thing be improved? No. No. So, God's Word is power, God's Word is truth, God's Word is eternal, God's Word saves. Isaiah 43, 1. This is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, He who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. If God calls you mine, who do you belong to? Him. Yeah, if God says, I'm saving you, can anyone stop Him? No. Nope. Because God's word is power, God's word is true, God's word is eternal, and when God says something about you, it is true. When God says to the darkness, let there be light, there is light. And when God says to you, you are mine, you are his. And then the last one here, his word is life. This is interesting. In this, this verse from Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is actually being tempted by Satan. And uh, there's an interesting dialogue going on, and Satan is trying to get Jesus to sin. And he says, Jesus, you should just turn this rock into some bread. You know, you've been fasting for a while, and, you know, mm, this, this, this rock over here could be a nice loaf. This rock over here kind of looks like a big French toast stick. Bagel rock over here. Pizza dough rock. Don't you, mm, don't you want that, hungry Jesus? And Jesus says in Matthew 4, 4, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, his word is life. What gives you life? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Not just some words, not just your favorite words, not just the easy to memorize words, not just the I feel good about these words words, but every word in the Bible, God's word, is from the mouth of God. And that gives us life. You need it. I need it. There is no life for us apart from what God says to us. And when we understand this, it changes us. And I'm going to wrap up today with a very quick little story. I can tell you all these awesome things about God's Word, but if you don't believe it, if you don't understand it, if you don't experience it, you will not find yourself trembling, because you can't really make yourself tremble. You can just look like you're doing that cool dance. But when you understand who God is, his power, His truth, the fact that He's eternal, the fact that He speaks and saves us, the fact that we need Him. When we grasp all those things about God's Word, when we open the Bible, it's not a chore anymore. I was at this camp when I was in the, in the summer, I believe, going into ninth grade. 
this camp right right here and we had gone crazy the night before or that night in the dorm it had been wild we were running around the counselors were upset with us pounding each other with pillows jumping on people's beds it was some insanity going on in there and it got to be really late and everybody went to bed but I was all hyped up like you know what had just happened and I was swinging and all this stuff and so I sat out in the hallway and I decided you know what will put me to sleep reading the Bible that old boring book is just going to knock me out. I'm going to be like, oh, no, no. so I went down and sat in the hallway where there was lights on because I didn't want to keep my roommates up. I opened up the Bible and I started to read it. One of my friends from a different room came out. And the reason he came out is because in all our ruckus, I had somehow gotten my shoes stuck into his pillowcase. <laughs> and so he's bringing them back to me. And so he sat down next to me and he said, can you just read that out loud? He was from Hong Kong. I said, sure, that's, that's cool. Uh, we weren't super close, but we were on the same hall. And so I just started reading. I don't even know what I was reading because I wasn't on some kind of Bible reading plan or something. I was on the get myself to sleep plan. So I started reading the Bible and out loud. And after a few minutes, he said, can you tell me how to become a Christian? And I hadn't done like any, here are the steps, or let me, let me give you the evangelism plan, or uh, let me you know, work some apologetic magic on your brain. I hadn't done any of that. I just read the Bible, and I wasn't even into it. He heard the Word of God, which is power, which is true, which, changed, which saves, which changed his life. And he heard it and he said, I want to become a Christian. He became a Christian that night. Uh, n not because I was awesome. In fact, in spite of me, because I was bored with the thing. I was treating the sharp knife of God's word as if it was so dull that I could sleep on it. And it was still so sharp that it saved a person's soul. That God saved a person's soul through, through his own word. And God is able to speak for himself and he wants to speak to you. He wants to speak into your mind so that you'll tremble and your heart will be changed and you'll be affected so that your life will be lived in a way that demonstrates that you love him. And God is able to do that. But if you remember what we read before, God is pleased by those who tremble at his word. Who tremble at his word. Not just the people who are faithful to check the box every day. Not just the people who hear it or go to their youth group or Sunday school or Awana or whatever it is that you do. When you open God's word and see what he says there, you are hearing the voice of God. The voice that invented life. The voice that can raise the dead. And the voice that calls you his own if you belong to his family. And I want to encourage you guys, when you, when you approach God's word, if you want to change and recognize that you need to live for God, your mind to change your heart to change your will, it all starts with the word of God. He can change you. And he will do it through his true, powerful, eternal, saving, life-giving word. Cool? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you would help us to see you for the awesome, amazing, unstoppable God that you are. And we pray that when we open up what you've given us in the Bible, that we would tremble. Not because we're supposed to, but because you are awesome. Help us not to look at a sharp knife and call it dull. Help us not to look at a venomous snake and want to cuddle up with it. Help us be people who recognize what we're dealing with and how amazing it is that a God like you would speak to people like us. And we pray that you would change our minds and that would change our hearts, which would change the way that we live our lives. And I pray that for myself, for the faculty and staff, for the counselors and for these students. Only you can do it. And we pray that you would. And we ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.